five little songs, five minutes, one minute, and then you're done. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as was alluded to, uh, it's entirely possible that there may be some discussion of uh, controversial issues when we're talking about PESA Plus. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe I'm on the panel to provoke some of those uh, controversial issues and uh, hopefully we can have a robust discussion. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we're, we're allotted 10 minutes, so there's only so much that we can talk about in 10 minutes, so I wanted to discuss a series of questions. Uh, so, PESA Plus, what is it? Uh, where did PESA Plus come from? What is it that the Forum Island countries want out of the PESA Plus process? What are Australia and New Zealand offering the Forum Island countries? And where to from here? And I have been looking at it for quite a few years, so I could talk about it for a long time, but there's only so much that can be said in 10 minutes, and hopefully I've picked the useful stuff. So PESA Plus, what is it? Uh, the short answer is that uh, opinions diverge on exactly what PACER Plus is uh, and there isn't agreement among the negotiating parties as to the scope and objectives of PACER Plus. Uh, PACER Plus stems from an earlier agreement called PACER, Pacific Agreement on Closer Economic Relations, but apparently PACER Plus is not an extension of the original PACER agreement. Uh, there's an assumption that uh, PESA Plus refers to the negotiation of a reciprocal free trade agreement between Australia, New Zealand and 14 Forum Island countries uh, in, in uh, such a fashion that it meets the rules of the WTO that govern regional trade agreements between developed and developing countries uh, in relation to trading goods and trading services. But uh, that, when I say that there's no formal agreement uh, the island countries and Australia and New Zealand between 2007 and 2009 negotiated a roadmap for the PACER Plus negotiations where they looked at what might be encompassed in PACER Plus trade negotiations, but that roadmap was abandoned. Uh, in the end, there was no agreement on the, form, the, the scope of an agreement. So negotiations have continued on a, a piecemeal basis, as it were, but there's no... Uh, final agreement on what PACER Plus would look like. Uh, to explain why there is this uh, lack of agreement on what a final agreement might look like, we can, we can have a bit of a think about where PACER Plus come, came from. And to do that, we need to go back nearly 20 years to the mid-1990s uh, with the conclusion of the Uruguay Round, the formation of the WTO. Uh, Globalisation was a buzzword in the late 1990s. And what we saw in the Pacific was increasing concern that the Pacific would be marginalised by these changes in the global trade regime because many Pacific Island countries relied on preferential access to developed country markets for some of their key exports, uh, things like sugar, things like canned tuna, things like uh, tree crops like copra, uh, cocoa, coffee. Uh, and so at the time there was a sense that globalisation might be proved difficult or undermine the, the trading position of some Pacific Island states. And it has to be remembered that as well at the time there was a move towards regionalism. So, you know, the NAFTA had just been formed in the, you know, in the North America. Uh, the EU had moved towards a common market. APEC was looking at open regionalism, having free trade amongst APEC states. And in the Pacific, in 1997, uh, the, Pacific Island, the Forum Island countries proposed a Pacific Regional Trade Agreement uh, to be called PARTA and they, uh, the island countries proposed that they pursue a regional trade agreement as a response to globalisation, banding together as a response to changes in the global economy. Uh, and at about the same time, the EU looked at revising its relationship with African, Caribbean and Pacific states and as part of that it wanted to move its trade preferences to reciprocal free trade agreements and re uh, suggested negotiating an economic partnership agreement with the island countries. So Australia saw that the island states were looking at negotiating an FTA amongst themselves and potentially an FTA with the EU. And so, but Australia uh, wanted 
to be included in any regional trade agreement. So uh, there's Alexander Downer saying that, that <coughs> what happened was they pressed the Forum Island countries to be included in these regional trade agreements. Uh, so, it, and, 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 and that's, we ended up with two agreements, PICTA and PESA, the Pacific Island Countries Trade Agreement, which is amongst the island countries themselves, and PESA, which is an agreement that at some point in the future, the island countries would negotiate an FTA with Australia. Uh, second part of the answer to the question where PESA Plus came from is that since 2000, Australia has moved away, or has in conjunction with its commitment to multilateral trade liberalisation, moved to pursue bilateral and regional FTAs in the Asia-Pacific region. So, you know, not all, the CER, for example, predates 2000, but many of these FTAs uh, have been pursued by DFAT in, over the past decade. And you can see there that PESA Plus encompasses states that are smack in the middle of this Asia-Pacific region. So PESA Plus is part of this broader strategy of pursuing uh, trade agreements uh, bilaterally and regionally for commercial and strategic reasons. Uh, <clears throat> what is it that the Forum Island countries want? Uh, the Forum Island countries above all want recognition of their unique circumstances in, in relation to trade. So it's been said over and over again and it barely bears repeating that uh, Forum Island countries possess a number of unique characteristics that make inter competitive international trade difficult. You know, this has been increasingly acknowledged by agencies like the World Bank. Uh, so things like Small, small size, small populations, uh, narrow resource bases, uh, distance from external markets, uh, high costs of transport, a lot of things that are exogenous outside of the policy realm that nevertheless make internationally competitive trade difficult. Uh, <clears throat> ever since the late 1990s, uh, small island states have been looking for recognition from the international community for their special trade related problems. Uh, so. You know, Fiji led a campaign at the WTO for recognition of a new category of states called small and vulnerable economies. Uh, in 1999, at the abandoned Seattle talks, uh, they looked at, you know, along with other small island states, looked at asking the WTO for a recognition of their special uh, trade-related challenges in the hope that the international community would be able to offer concessionary arrangements to small island states to help them participate more fully in the international trading system. Uh, and then in, uh, in recent decades, in the oh, sorry, over the past decade, in negotiations with the European Union and subsequently with Australia uh, and New Zealand, the Forum Island countries have consistently argued that a, a conventional free trade agreement would offer relatively little benefits to them in, in terms of economic growth and so have asked for concessions from, or, or unique arrangements intended to help meet the unique constraints that islands face. So in negotiations with the European Union, very briefly, that included, uh, they asked for extra development assistance for building trade capacity, they asked for labour mobility arrangements for people to be able to go and work in, in the EU, uh, the island, island states asked the European Union to look at streamlining ways that its investment agencies work in the Pacific. In short, for the European Investment Bank to establish a branch in a Pacific Island country and for them to look at ways to get financing to small and medium enterprises. And so all of these things are additional to a standard FTA. And, but the Europeans uh, came back with a standard FTA and uh, basically did not take on board all of the island countries' appro uh, proposals. And so the EPA negotiations uh, fell way below everybody's expectations. Uh, Simon Crean in 2009 said, we have learnt the lesson from the EPA negotiations. Unlike the EPA's, PACER Plus will not be just a trade agreement. So the Australian government's policy is apparently that uh, an PACER Plus will not be negotiated as a conventional FTA, or at least if it is going to be a conventional FTA, that on additional to that, there will be uh, measures that are intended to help the island countries participate more meaningfully in, in, in international trade. And what do the island countries want? Well, really, it's narrowed down to two things, uh, at, or at least at the top of the list are two things. And the first is uh, new and additional access to the Australian and New Zealand labour markets, 
uh, over and above the RSC schemes and the seasonal workers program uh, that currently exist. Development assistance to help develop trade capacity. And importantly, this is development assistance over and above assistance to implement the agreement. So it's, yep, we're, we're done. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just, I think I've only got two slides Brutal left. Words. <laughs> yes, no, that's okay. I think I've only got two slides left. Uh, <clears throat> because the very short answer is that so far the Australian government has not uh, put an awful lot of interest to the island countries on the table. So even when it comes to those two key uh, demands with regards to labour mobility and with regards to uh, <clears throat> development assistance, uh, you know, there's the Pacific's lead negotiator during the negotiations from 2009 to 2011, uh, Chris Noonan. He said there's nothing really of value on the table. And so finally, where to from here? Well, the negotiations may drag out for some time. There's little sign of political engagement from the Australian government. So by that I mean Emerson never mentions it. Uh, Simon Crean previously did uh, pl place, place some political capital in the starting the negotiations, but really, other than the occasional comment from Richard Miles, there's not much political commitment to doing a unique trade agreement to meet the needs of the island states. Now, it's a little rushed at the end, but that's it for me.